Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. God's message of love and hope is not a pretty please kind of, can I sell you on my program kind of thing. It's almost, almost preached that way. This is a command to repent and to believe the gospel. This is a command to turn from wickedness and to humble yourself and, and receive the gift that I have given to you through, through my son. I've done everything necessary. But you see, in the hearts of men is a refusal to obey that message. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. When? On the day he, be, he comes to be glorified in his holy people and be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed our testimony. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by this is interesting. By his power, by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Where does the energy come from? It comes from God, doesn't it? Well, I don't have it, but he has it. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had to contend with a whole lot of false doctrine in his day, didn't he? And some of it concerned the coming of Christ. So here's what he begin, how he begins in chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So somebody was spreading bad information saying, did you hear the latest revelation from Paul? The day of the Lord has already happened. Sending him a letter saying, this is, you know, this is Paul's new teaching or something. Somehow they were getting a report that was false. And Paul wanted to really straighten it out. He says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about our being gathered to him. I'll tell you what, there's, there's so many things that people have divided up and complicated the end of the age, and it's so simple. He's going to come, he's going to gather his own people, and he's going to destroy the world, and judgment's going to follow. End of story. But anyway, Paul is, is saying there's something happening, there's something that's got to happen before all that happens. There's a rebellion that's going to occur. Now, a rebellion is not just a general attitude. It is against something. This is a description, again, of the spirit of man who knows something about God. They know what they ought to do. They know there's a God. They know it instinctively in their hearts, and they say, I will not listen. I will follow my own lusts. And just as Paul described, it's not just that I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to glory in that, and I'm going to boast in it. I'm going to take pride in what I believe and what I stand for. Man, that is an in-your-face rebellion. God, I will not listen to you. David wrote, why do the nations, why do the heathen rage? The people gather themselves together against, you know, against my anointed one. He that sits in the heavens is going to laugh. I'll tell you what. It's not a laugh of pleasure, but a, can you imagine... A puny man shaking his fist at God and saying, I'm, I don't have to listen to you. I can do as I please. This is a God who could sneeze and come out and come out with a galaxy. Just to put it in a crude way. Oh, my. Is that not an indicator of what sin does to the human mind and the human heart? It absolutely brings a blindness. And there's a lot in here I'm not going to try to decode there's a whole lot of teaching about it. But it says, The man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. I'll tell you one thing. There is no building that will ever be considered to be God's temple. 
God does not dwell in temples made with hands. We, human beings, were made to be God's temple. Whatever this is talking about, it's not talking about a building somewhere. It's talking about humanity. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back. So you've got a principle. You have got a principle in Paul's day of lawlessness. That is rebellion against God. God, I will not have you rule over me. I will not yield. That principle was there. But there was something restraining. Something holding the dam back. Can you imagine what this world would be like if God had stepped back and said, all right, devil, you can do as you please. We wouldn't be here. If God stepped back, the devil would have overrun this world and it would be hell on earth. Well, you've got some pictures of it in some of the countries of today. You want to go to hell on earth? Go to Somalia. Go to North Korea. Go to places like that. Absolutely hell. And yet God still has some people. Praise God. But all oh, this, this world would be a very different place if God had not done some restraining. God had not said, devil, you can do this much, but you cannot do, you know, what you really want to do, which was what? To unite the world. To bring everybody under some form of government that is going to reflect his character and his dominion over the human race. Totally blinded, totally in rebellion against the God of heaven. That's what Satan was after. Do you not see that shaping up in our day? Do you not see the forces that are at work in our world that are absolutely against God? You know, we, we grew up in a land that almost made you think that America was a special place, and I, I believe in many ways it has been. Here we're free. Here we're in a nation that's friendly to the gospel, and generation after generation will pass, and we will live, and we will die, and life will be good and comfortable, and then we'll die and go to heaven, and that's, you know, that's almost like on into the future. That's how it's going to be. Well, folks, it ain't that way. This nation has turned its back on God. The powers that be. I believe God has a, has a people. I don't believe it's as nearly as many as a lot of them think. But that isn't the way it is. That's not the world we're in. And I, I just have a special sense from the Lord that the Lord wants a lot of young people to get this. You need to understand the world you're part of. There are some strong arguments out there that are going to try to sway you and pull you and, and just blunt this message. And God delivers from ever being haters or ever having that kind of a spirit towards people. That's not it. That's not what it's about. Oh, my. We need to get, we need to understand. We need to see what is unfolding in front of us because God is allowing it. There is a divine judgment clock that is ticking in our world. If that is not what the Lord was revealing when he came, when he visited this church so many years ago, and I'm surely other places, I don't want to make anybody think we're special. But if that was not the message, I don't know what is. It's wonderful to see things in here. It's another thing for the Lord to, st to step into history and say, now is the time. Now is the time. Darkness has been turned loose and it is swallowing up this world. But I believe what Paul was looking forward to, a time where there was going to be a rebellion against God. This is, this is people who know. This is people who've heard. But they say, no, I reject that. I will not go that way. We're, go we're going to have our own truth here. We're going to be the measure of what's right and what's wrong. And he says the spirit, verse 7, the spirit of secret power of lawlessness is already at work. That's what I just said. And the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Amen. So you see, the, you see the judgment of the, you see what the coming of Christ is about? He starts this passage talking about our gathering to him, his coming and our gathering. But now he's saying when he comes, it's going to be a, it's a coming in judgment. It's the same coming. But now, he says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. Folks, we need the Lord. I'm not smart enough to stand up against this, are you? But we've got a God. 
we have someone in our midst who is faithful, who understands everything that's going on. Doesn't want us to be afraid, but does want us to be alive, alert and awake. All right? And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, well, why are they perishing? They perish because they refused to love the truth. See, this is a hardening of heart. The same thing that happened in Noah's day, same thing that happened in Israel is happening again today. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. So once you have this, this uh, quality or this characteristic of refusing the truth, what happens? What does God do? How, how does he react? For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. You wonder why people are so blind and so sure of themselves at the same time? Yeah. That's why. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have done what? Delighted? Delighted in wickedness? Do we not see that in our day? People who are proud of their wickedness. Oh my. But oh, thank God for what he, comes, what he follows us up with. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've, I've had this come back to my mind several times, a simple thing that Jesus said to his disciples when he was talking in that context, I believe, about the coming of the Lord and the condition of the world. And he says, fear not, little flock. Don't be afraid, little flock. Doesn't that kind of give us a picture? Imagine how Noah must have felt eight of them against the world. Imagine the mocking the disdain that he had to put up with in that world, warning him about a judgment that was coming. And yet there was something, there was a conviction that was from heaven itself that fueled his faith, that made him able to stand true. Folks, that's, again, that's the world we live in. We need to hear the voice of our Savior who says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Praise God. We, we can have a sober apprehension, a sober understanding of the world we live in and not, not be filled with fear because we know that God is going to be faithful to his people. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. I don't know what he's going to call upon his people to do, but I believe there's something he's called us to do in this hour. Noah built a boat. The early church preached the gospel among, the, among Israel until judgment came, and God saved those that were his. God has a people today. We are here for a reason to serve God and to stand in this world. God has given us a, a, a message of hope that there's a lot of this darkness that's going to cause some people to be awakened and say, hey, I need something. God, give us a, a something that is so crystal clear, such a contrast with this world that they will come to the light. He is the only light we have. There's no light in me. It's not a light in my opinion or, or anything like that. It's his presence in his church that we need. Think of some of the other passages where God's people were encouraged along this line. Ephesians chapter 5 is one that pops to mind. Verse 8, for you were once darkness. And that's something we need to never forget, folks. We need to never forget what we are and how much we need him so that we, are, we never, never occupy the place of looking down and having a condemning spirit towards people. Jesus didn't except for the ones that, were, that hardened their heart in, their, in that form of wickedness. But I mean, when you talk about people caught in sin, he had a compassionate spirit. And so do we. So should we. Because we're no better. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. 
For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do, to do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, or rise from among the dead, is what the sense of it is, and Christ will shine on you. Isn't that an awesome promise? Wake up, get up, look, you know, reach up to God. And what? God will shine on you. God will, Christ will give you light, I think it says in the King James. Rise up and Christ will give you light. That's a promise. I intend to hold him to that, do you? I need light. I don't know how to steer my way through this darkness that we're, we're in. But I got somebody who's with me who's promised never to leave me. So do you. You reach up with your heart to him, and he'll give you the light that you need. He'll give me the light that I need. What an awesome promise. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Think of Romans 13, just a few uh, words in that. Obviously, there's so much you could say, and it's a pretty big subject. Um... Well, again, he's talking about how to live in, in the world and how to, how to be God's people. In verse 11 of chapter 13, and do this understanding the present time. Is that something we need? As you're going to school, as you're going to work, do we need to understand the world that we live in? Do we need to have a sense of where it's going? Do we need to have as clear a picture in our minds as Noah had? Yeah, judgment is coming. We know that it's coming, and this time it's fire. You know, I just toss this in. I, I, there's, there's a couple of news sites that I check pretty regularly. And it's lot, most of it's depressing if you kind of look at it and forget all this. But somebody was, t I guess the, the discussion going on among all the comments at the end of a story had to do with the condition of the nation and the fact that we were, you know, we'd gone so far and maybe, maybe it was too far and all of that. And somebody dropped in this little comment, and boy, it really struck a chord with me. And they, ref they referred back to a time when they were out at a beautiful lake in a beautiful setting on a sunny summer day one time, and all of a sudden, within the space of five minutes, black clouds rolled in, and, a st and thunder rolled, and lightning struck, and it was a strong storm that just came up out of nowhere. And it was something that happened in his heart, and it seemed like the Lord had said, when my judgment falls upon this nation, it will be like that. It will be sudden. It will be without warning. Did not Paul say that about the world? When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. But that day will not over, overtake you as a thief because you're awake and you're alive and you're awake. I'll tell you, the things that will bring distress to this, to this world will, should bring us joy. My God, when these things happen, we need to lift up our hearts and say, Lord, it's not going to be long. Oh, Lord, that's the world I long for. This world, you can have it. We've got to live here, but don't, put your, don't sink your roots here. Don't put your hope in this world. Don't plan for long, you know, a long, tranquil life in this world. Serve God. Stay close. Listen to his voice. Understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. Oh, doesn't that sound good? The night is nearly over. The day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The course of mankind, every time God's light is rejected, it results in darkness and blindness and ultimately in a condition where there is no more answer. God will not always strive with men. In every age, this has been true. It's true in our age. 
And we are seeing that condition more and more and more. And I believe, as I said with all my heart, just as there was in Noah's day, just as there was in Jesus' day, there is a clock that is ticking. There's a day that God knows when Jesus is going to come. And boy, it'd be all right for me if it's today. But it's going to come. And it'll come like a, like a trap upon the world. But God is faithful to his people. You put your hope and your trust in him, he will never betray that trust. He loves you. He has everything you need, everything that I need. Just as he was faithful to his people in Israel, just as he was faithful to Noah, he is faithful in, our, in this hour. And we could look to him, but boy, we need to be, we need to be awake. And I'll come back to the thing that I guess was the most, was the uppermost in my mind. We need to recognize the condition of the world and the deception that has taken root in the minds of people in our day. Recognize it for what it is. Always hold it up to the light of the word of God and stand true to this. God is looking for people. As he was in Malachi's day, there was a great darkness that had overrun Israel again. But there were people that spoke oft one to another. They were the ones who still had this fear of God in their hearts. God took note. God sees your heart today. I pray that he can awaken it with a hunger, with a desire to say, to recognize where the world's going and to say, no, I'm, I'm with you. That's the kingdom I belong to. I'm willing. I, I, don't want to even, I don't want to be like Lot's wife. Yeah, I'll walk out, but I'll look back because that's where my heart's really at. I want to be one that's able to turn my back and say, Lord, even so come, Lord Jesus. Oh, my. Don't you think there's going to be some shouting and some, some rejoicing on that day? Well, let's stand true. Let's do exactly what Paul said in so many places and what the Lord said. Be ready. Stand true. Keep looking up. Keep looking to him. Keep be, uh, let, let's, let's, be, uh, let's our goal and our heart be the thing that God has called us to, is to become like him. Let's let him do the saving. Let's love each other. Let's stand true. And we're going to have a God that's going to bring us, bring his people through. And one day we're going to stand on the other side. And, and he's going to put us on, on display, not because we are anything, but because of his grace. Because the master craftsman has been able to make something eternal, of eternal worth, out of somebody as worthless as we are. But he's going to put us on display and said, this is what I've been doing. And you down there who have hardened your hearts, there's nothing but judgment. It's a sobering time. It's a time when we need to be rejoicing too. But I just pray, especially for the younger ones who've growing up in a world that us older ones don't even recognize. You need to know what's going on. You need a clear picture. And I pray that God will open your heart. Yes. Because this world is going to pull on you. Some of it's going to sound pretty reasonable. But I'll tell you what, there is truth. You, you, you rise up from among the dead. You lift up your heart to God. And he'll give you light. He'll give you understanding. He'll give you what you need. He is faithful. Praise God. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication the Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at this same time, and may God richly bless you until then.